Welcome everyone. Uh, I can hear, people can hear me now, great. Um, thank you for joining our program tonight, Intro to Foraging. My name is Susan Eastland I'm on, and I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. Um, this program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel later on. We are running a basic hybrid format um, so thank you everyone for your patience. Feel free to send in feedback. Thank you for letting me know that I was on mute. Um, for those attending in person, there will be time um, at the end for questions. I am so excited to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight. Um, Rachel Goklowski is a Massachusetts certified educator, state certified in mushrooming and a programming partner with the Museum of Natural History, the Sudbury Valley Trustees and other nonprofits and land trusts. She comes from a long line of foragers, including her great-grandfather, Arthur W. Fairbanks, who was the founder of the Boston Mycological Club in the 1800s. Please join me in welcoming Rachel. Thank you very much. I'm turning this up. Oh, I'm on. All right. Oh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cary Library for having me. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight is how to start foraging. Um, obviously with a title like Intro to Foraging, I'm gonna be going over, you know, just basic things like what, what do you need to start foraging? Do you need any specific things? Um, once you start identifying plants, what's the best way to go about identifying plants? How do we forage safely so that we know what we're eating and that we don't uh, get ourselves sick or worse? Um, and then we'll talk a, few, a little bit about um, foraging ethics, where is okay to forage, where is not okay to forage, um, and um, just basic foraging safety guidelines and such. So if you have any questions, uh, those of, of us in the room obviously can have a little priority uh, of, over asking questions. Um, try to keep it relevant to kind of what I'm talking about um, when you ask a question. If you have a just like a general question, like maybe you arrived here with questions, there's gonna be some time after the presentation to um, ask those types of questions. Um, so uh, if you're um, on Zoom right now, you can um, ask questions, you can type them in and someone will help you with those and possibly be able to pose those questions to me right now live. Okay, um, any questions before we start? Okay, great. All right, so um, we're going to have the presentation up here. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, so that was my little intro there. Okay, so of course, there's a lot of benefits to foraging. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know that there was at least some kind of benefit to foraging. So obviously there's a lot of nutritious foods out there. Now there's wild versions of foods that we see in the supermarket and those wild versions actually have a lot more nutrition. Uh, one of those reasons would be that when you're farming, we've been farming these soil so much, they're kind of depleted of nutrients, but also when you genetically modify foods, they might look better and taste better, but they lose a lot of their nutrition. So when you're out there foraging wild food, you are going to get a lot higher dosages of vitamins and minerals and other healthy components to the plants than you would get um, in their cultivated version or anything you'd get in the supermarket. So huge benefit right there. Of course, it's a, a low cost, family friendly hobby. I mean, you don't really need much. Um, I usually just bring a backpack. I, you know, of course you're gonna put sunscreen, you're gonna put insect repellent on. We don't wanna get bitten by any ticks or mosquitoes. Um, so the same sort of things that you bring when you're packing a hike for a hike. Um, but then in addition to that, I like to have plastic bags. Plastic bags are great for leafy greens, like salad greens um, and other types of leafy greens. You can see how this is already drooping because it's been sitting out. Um, so if you have a plastic bag and you put a little bit of water in that plastic bag, what it will do is it will make a, like a humid environment in the plastic bag that's more humid than the humidity inside the leaves themselves. So your leaves won't droop when you have them in your plastic bag. If you're going to collect mushrooms, 
And here, this is a reishi mushroom. Don't put these in a plastic bag. Um, if you put mushrooms in a plastic bag, any of the um, bacteria that may be on this will just explode exponentially. So you wanna put mushrooms in a basket or a paper bag or a cloth bag. Um, nuts and seeds you wanna keep dry as well. So I like to put nuts and seeds in a paper bag. Um, right now, for example, I like to collect cattail pollen. And I use that cattail pollen. The cattail pollen, if you don't know what cattails are, they, they look like a corn dog on a stick. And they're usually like in the middle of a marsh or, or a pond, right? And on top of that corn dog, which is the female flower, is the male flower. And right now, the male flower has tons of pollen on it. And this pollen um, is not light enough to be uh, airborne, right? So it's just going to, when, when the wind blows that cattail, the, the pollen's just gonna fall from the male flower down to the female flower. So if I have a paper bag, I can go over to that cattail, kind of bend it down, put the paper bag over it and just tap it gently. And then I'll have a bunch of cattail pollen in my bag. Why do I want cattail pollen? Well, pollen is great for allergies if you're not allergic to pollen, okay? So for example, we'll take bee pollen to try to help us with our allergies. You know, might go into the vitamin shop and buy bee pollen. Well, if you consume pollen, it actually helps you fight seasonal allergies. So what I do with that pollen is I will replace about 25% of flour in any recipe, any baking recipe, and it, it's gluten-free. And so I can replace that with the pollen. So I got 25% of pollen. So say if it was like a cup of flour for your basic muffin recipe, put a quarter of a cup of pollen and then three quarters of a cup of whatever flour that you're using. And then go ahead and bake your muffins and they'll be golden you know, in color and have a little bit more flavor to them. So you know, just some different things like, so I always, when I have a backpack, it always has paper bags, plastic bags. I sometimes have gloves, like if I wanna go for things like stinging metal or I wanna dig for some roots, I'll have some gardening gloves in there. So really inexpensive stuff, a pocket knife, so that you can cut things that you need to. Um, I actually have a buck knife for mushrooms like this because they're really hard to cut. Like, so even just a little, um, even a little pocket knife is not gonna cut through this necessarily. So I use a buck knife um, and a Swiss army knife. Not a lot of cost involved in this hobby, right? And it's family friendly, my kids love it. Um, they've been foraging with me since they were in my backpack like their whole lives, right? And now they're preteens. Um, so obviously you're gonna save on groceries, right? So not only are you getting more nutritious food, food that fights disease, um, food that will help you prevent disease, um, you're gonna save a lot of money on groceries because you can replace like a side dish or even a whole meal with forest food. And Sustainable foraging, sustainable foraging meaning we're not gonna go out and start collecting tons of wild, um, rare native plants. What I usually collect is just common weeds, even if they're native weeds, um, they're renewable resource. So native weeds, if there's lots and lots of them um, and they grow every year annually, they're a renewable resource, we can collect them. If they're a native plant that's rare, obviously you're just gonna admire that, maybe take some photos, but you're not gonna really collect a lot of um, a rare native plant, like say like trilliums and things like that. Even though trilliums are edible, um, we're not starving, we don't need to, to collect those. So if you collect sustainably and you focus on invasive edible plants and renewable native weeds, um, you're going to help the environment out, you're gonna help your health, and, um, and especially like if you forage something like these autumn berries or autumn olive, they're extremely invasive, very, very plentiful. You can get pounds and pounds and pounds of delicious berries. These are usually um, start ripening around the end of September into October. I like to wait until like mid-October when they're a little riper. Um, I have a whole um, webinar I did on this for the Sudbury Valley trustees 
that you can find on my website, which goes from like picking to preparing. And um, it's like, um, takes you all through the autumn berry process. And um, so obviously collecting these since they're highly, highly invasive is going to help the environment give more room to native plants if you collect these. And um, they're very, very, very high in lycopene, which is um, uh, those of you that know like um, raw tomatoes have has lycopene. And so we, oh, we wanna have lycopene. Well, 17 times higher in lycopene than raw tomatoes. And to me, they taste kind of like a, a little bit like a cranberry and pomegranate. And then the older, you know, the, the more mature that they get, the more like a pomegranate, less mature, it's like tart like a cranberry. And that's autumn berries. And over here, that flower over there is jewelweed. And I keep picking up this poor, sad looking jewelweed, but you are gonna save a lot on over the counter remedies. Like um, the Johnson and Johnson brothers um, who invented the Band-Aid, this is plantain. Plantain is the plant that inspired the Band-Aid. It helps um, clean out and, and um, helps heal cuts and scrapes and burns and things. And I'll talk a little bit more about this plant. But sadly, since they invented the, the Band-Aid and drugstores started to come around, we lost our knowledge of basic first aid plants that, that work way, way better than anything that you would buy in CVS. So for example, this plant here, jewelweed, and when it flowers, it looks like that flower there on this slide. This was what the Native Americans used and we probably still use um, for poison ivy. It's incredible for eczema. Once I learned about this plant and started to make solves from this and, and other plants, I didn't have to take my toddlers to the, the uh, dermatologist anymore because they had eczema, terrible eczema all around their mouths and um, you know, any, you know, inside their elbows, things like that. And so they had been prescribed a steroid and the steroid really would only work for maybe a couple of weeks and then it would wear off and we'd have to stop using the steroid for a week and then you could use it again. It was ridiculous. This I could put on them whenever, as many times as I wanted and it worked better than the steroid. And I saved a lot of money. I didn't have to keep driving them to the dermatologist every other month and um, to get their eczema taken care of. So once you learn about these plants, you, you'll be amazed at how much you know, better your health will be, how much um, money you'll save, and um, just how much benefits there are. Okay, so one of the things that people do when they're foraging is they like to look up stuff on their phone. Okay, now these apps are pretty amazing. Um, I've seen them work pretty well, but I've also seen them be long. And then I've seen them bring up like three different plants and you're like, well, which one could this be? So all this is really good for is just, just kind of point you, maybe point you in the right direction, but never eat a plant based on pulling this up on this app, okay? This is like a first step, maybe. If you're completely clueless, like you look and like, I have no idea what this plant is. And you pull you know, the, the app up and it pulls up one or two plants, then go for your foraging guide, okay? So you're going to see me pushing foraging guides through this. I don't sell any foraging guides, but um, the reason why I keep talking about buying these, and I will keep talking about buying these, or the library, ask your local library um, to, to carry some of these, is because not only are you going to find out whether your app is right by checking scientifically through the key identifiers, and we'll talk about that, you're gonna find out more than that. You're gonna find out how to prepare this food. What parts of the plants are edible? What parts aren't? Are there any poisonous lookalikes? Super, super important. You don't wanna poison yourself, right? And then it will take you through maybe like um, recipe ideas, ways to you know, dry and save the plant, medicinal purposes, things like that. So depending on the guide, some of them are good for recipes and some of them aren't. But I recommend um, Northeast Foraging by Lita Meredith. And she lives in Massachusetts. So everything in here, I have found everything. And she does cover all that stuff. She covers identifying it, whether there's poisonous lookalikes, um, ideas, ways to prepare, preserve the plant. 
it's um, I wish she wrote another one because you know there's only so many plants that she could cover in here. Great photographs. It, it would be great if she did like a volume two, volume three, and like kept covering more and more plants. She doesn't cover any mushrooms in here. Um, another one I like is I like Samuel Fair. He wrote a couple of books. He's like more Midwest, but most of the plants in here I've been able to find. I've been able to find things like wild rice, which is more like need to be south or, or more west. Um, one of the features I like in this book is there's a section in here that it'll say, oh, cattail. Well, did you know that there's so many different edible parts of cattail? It'll tell you all the different edible parts when you can forage them. So of course the plant's gotta mature, right? So it starts, it starts coming up and it'll say, oh, cattail rhizomes. You can get those in like the winter time. You can go under the frozen uh, pond and then get the rhizomes and those are edible. And then it will go, okay, now you can get the shoots in the spring and early spring and you can pull the shoots up and you can eat those. And then, so it'll tell you on these charts, the different parts of the plant and uh, when they can be foraged. It may be off by like a week or two, you know, because we've had climate change and we've, and this is also not for New England. So it may be off by a week or two, but at least it'll give you an idea of how many different parts are edible in the plant. And then basic botany. I mean, you don't have to be a botanist to know how to forage, but I, I do like things like the Peterson and Audubon guides because they'll have sections in here and the, it, because you'll look up a plant and it'll say, has a pinnate leaf. You're like, what the heck is that pinnate leaf? Well, you can look it up, right? Because if, if you just pull stuff up on an app, it's not gonna tell you how to ID it safely and you're not gonna know if you're right. You're not gonna know if the app is right, I mean. Um, so you'll go through this and it will say things like, you know, pinnate leaf. And in here, she does have a section where she talks about different parts of plants, right? So yeah, you can Google a plant, but you find that plant, like say you know you can eat cattail, you look it up, you Google it. On that page, it might tell you, that, that, that site might tell you a little bit about how to ID it, but not completely how to ID it. It might tell you like one recipe for one part of the plant, right? But these guides, guidebooks will have a lot more information. That way you're not piecemeal Googling it, trying to find a page that that gives you the full information on the plant. So that's why I have so many of these guides. And then finally, botany in a day. So it's gonna take you a lot more than a day to go through this book. I still pick it up and go to different sections because um, what this does is it teaches you to do plant families. So you'll see there's families of plants and each of those plant families has some aspects in common. So you might find like a wild mustard that you've never seen before. And you'll know it's a wild mustard because of the flower. Um, and everything in the mustard family is edible. So there's some plant families that are dangerous and, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but this is, this is really a good resource. You don't have to memorize the stuff in here. You don't have to know a lot of stuff about botany. But what I like about this is that it kind of gives me a sense of, okay, I've never seen this plant before, but I think it's in the raspberry family because it has, you know, a segmented berry or whatever. And then when I pull the berry off, it's hollow. Okay. So it will give you kind of an idea of plant families, you know, and that way you can focus on safer plant families. When you start, you can be like, okay, I'm going to stay in these plant families that don't have any poisonous members. And then you kind of move your way through. Okay. So that just kind of lay in it, lay in the foundation. Any questions so far? We're gonna, yeah. Can you eat uh, Japanese knotweed? Yes. So she asked, can you eat Japanese knotweed? Please eat Japanese knotweed. It is so invasive. It's terrible. It will grow up through pavement. Um, it has gotten so bad in Europe that it's, it's growing up through people's house foundations and coming up into their living room. So um, Japanese knotweed, I'll have a photo of it on one of the slides coming up. It's really only edible as a shoot. So think about like rhubarb and bamboo and you know things like things that you eat as a shoot that look similar would be like um, some people think it looks like asparagus. 
Uh, we only eat asparagus as a shoot. It doesn't taste like asparagus. To me, it tastes like when you sweeten it up with like some honey or something, it, it tastes like Jolly Rancher green apple candy to me. It's really, really good. Um, so we only eat that as a shoot in the spring when it's you know less than a foot tall. And then if, it, if it's like three feet or shorter, you can juice it and you get like this pink juice and you're gonna wanna sweeten that too. And, and then you'll be drinking like a Jolly Rancher green apple lemonade type tasting thing. It's really good. Okay, so finally, yeah, foraging, great way to just appreciate the natural world. The more you get outside, the better. Um, and you can be, you know, eight, you can be 80. It doesn't matter how old you are. I'm constantly learning. I've been doing this my whole life and I'm still learning new plants all the time. You know, we get plants coming up from the South, you know, more invasive plants. And I'm like, golden spindle, what the heck is this? You know, I'm hiking in the middle of the winter and there's this green lush looking vine, golden spindle, another invasive plant. So I'm always learning. Okay, so we have seasons for foraging. It's not the same seasons that we think about. Um, instead of, um, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, we have early spring where you're gonna find like Japanese knotweed shoots, you're gonna find fiddleheads, um, roots and plants, you know, so that we're talking like March and April, early spring, where you're gonna see the shoots of plants. And sometimes only the shoot is edible, like Japanese knotweed, only the shoot is edible, right? Then you get into mid to late spring, which is like what we're in right now, you know, basically it's summer, right? Um, you can still find some of those late spring plants and I have some of them here on the table. And that's where you're getting, there's still some shoots, some later shoots that come up like pokeweed and things like that. Um, other greens, the salad greens are kind of gone by. Um, how many of you have ever planted lettuce in your garden? You know, when it starts flowering, how bad it tastes like, that's what's happening to all the salad greens right now is they're flowering and they get too bitter at that point. But there are still some late, some, uh, late spring and into summer salad greens. And I have a couple of them on the table right now. So you can still make salad for yourself all through the summer if you, if you know what those salad greens are and some of them are invasive. And then of course you got summer where I love it because that's when you have a lot of mushrooms. And I, I do teach intro to mushrooming. And um, I've got one coming up July, uh, July 30th. I'm gonna put one up on my Facebook and Instagram. So you'll see that because the Tower Hill one sold out already. So you get seeds and nuts in the summer. And um, so you'd be surprised how many different seeds and nuts there are out there. And like um, right now, some of the seeds that are, are, I don't have any of them right now, but some of the things that are start starting to already mature is dock, like curly dock and bitter dock. Those seeds are already starting to mature and you can use them instead of bran to make like bran muffins because they, they're on the dock seeds are on these little um, bracts, these papery bracts, and it's hard to get the seeds off of that. So I don't even bother to get the seeds off and then I just use it like as bran and my granola and things like that. And of course berries, we're starting to see some, um, Strawberries, wild strawberries. I already ate my first wild blueberries yesterday. So, so, so good. Um, and then you get, start starting to get the raspberries. There's summer raspberries, um, black raspberries right now. And then in the fall, there'll be some red raspberries. So just, you know, gift that keeps on giving. And then the fall, we have even more mushrooms and you can start going for things like roots. You can start harvesting roots again, just like in early spring, you could get roots and more berries and more nuts. Like so, so toward the end of the summer, you start getting things like black walnuts and um, hickory nuts and things like that into the fall. And then finally, winter, believe it or not, you can forage some stuff in the winter. You can get crab apples and rose hips and things like that. And I even like those autumn berries after the first hard freeze, um, you get them right away after the first hard freeze because they'll start to actually um, ferment on the bush. And then you'll see a bunch of little drunken birds flying around <laughs> uh, because they, the birds love autumn berries. Um, but when they're after the first hard freeze, a lot of that tartness comes out, like that tartrate, that acidic uh, flavor comes out. And then you have just a really sweet 
autumn berry and I, I make fruit leather and all kinds of things, uh, put it in my smoothies. Oh yeah, you can get bark. I, I like to harvest hickory bark in the middle of winter because with all the greenery down, you can really see the shag bark hickory trees as you're hiking, you can see them way into the forest and you can just gather the bark and make hickory syrup, things like that. So you don't worry that it's the winter. There's still some things I get chaga mushrooms, things like that in the winter. So, okay, so how are you gonna start out? Um, well, that says some edibles with no poisonous lookalikes. That's what that says. So I like to start safe. When I was a little, little kid, my favorite thing was wood sorrel. It does look like, um, does look like clover, but clover has flowers like this, like little pom-poms, right? But wood sorrel has, a yellow flower with petals. And wood sorrel tastes like lemonade. And so you can throw it on your salad, you can make tea with it, it has a lot of vitamin C. And um, it has three leaflets that are perfect hearts. And there's no poisonous lookalikes to it. And then there's sheep sorrel. And the leaves look like little sheep faces with little ears hanging down. And this also tastes like lemonade. And if you've ever had um, French sorrel, um, French cooking with sorrel in it, um, it's like a lemony, um, very refreshing flavor. And so I, I like to wilt these with a little butter or ghee um, and then put it over rice or put it over pasta. And it's just delicious. You've got an instant pasta sauce with a lot of vitamin C. And that's around. Um, oh, okay, so these are wine berries. So anything in the raspberry family is has no poisonous lookalikes. Any bunch berry, really, here in, in North America, once you get out, I mean, in New England, once you get out of New England, you really need to worry about your segmented berries. But here you've got segmented berries. And so you've got raspberries, you've got blackberries, you've got boysenberries, um, many different varieties, loganberries, things like that. Those are all edible and they're all pretty safe to ID here in New England. And wine berries don't have as much flavor as, as raspberries, but they're really delicious and they're really juicy and they're starting to get ripe right now, as well as the raspberries. And wine berries have like, they're kind of like a fuzzy, you can see how, how fuzzy and hairy looking the stalks are on this plant. And, and, um, and then when you pull off the berry, it has this yellow little, um, stem that it pulls off of. So there's a lot of like ways to ID it when you look it up. And then over here we have a false strawberry or sink foil. And it's just to show that the point they look alike for strawberries is not poisonous either. So you've got the false strawberry, which is also edible, just doesn't have any really any flavor. So you'll be eating it, you'll be like, oh, the strawberry has no flavor. It's it's sink foil or the false strawberry. So these are all kind of safe things that I start out, like, like um, when I start teaching foraging to kids, I start in, in those safe plant families. Okay, so how do we ID this? Oh, you got a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so Rachel, can you just go back to the two slides before um, someone on Zoom just asked if you can name the plants? Um, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so we've got up here, we have garlic mustard. Remember I talked about garlic mustard? Now, this is an invasive plant. So this is the way garlic mustard looks in the spring. Garlic mustard is a biennial. So that means that it has a two year life cycle. So the first year it won't put up any flowers. It won't put up a stalk. And um, that first year it, um, it tastes better, but okay. So there's one drawback to gar garlic mustard is it has cyanide in it. But don't be scared. It's just like a, a low, 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 low amount. And, and if you cook it, once you cook it even just a little bit, the cyanides are gone. Trust me, please eat it. Um, so the second year plant, there's less cyanide. And so if you were, if you were concerned about that, you, you'd have to eat like, like a boatload of it to be affected by the, the level of cyanide in it. I mean, apple seeds have cyanide in it, okay? So, but the second year plant has a lower cyanide content but the leaves don't taste as good, in my opinion. And they and once the once the flower stalk starts coming up, 
then just like your, your lettuce in your garden, it doesn't taste as good. So I like to collect it for pesto and things like that before the flower stalk comes up. And so here it is without the flower stalk. And, and um, this is the second year of plant. It just, it's just early in the spring, and so it doesn't have the flower stalk up yet. And so that's what I like to collect for the pesto. The first year plant, there'll be like little microgreens that I'll like to throw in an egg salad sandwich or something. But again, I'm using like a little tiny amount of the microgreens, like the little, little sprouts. We're talking like end of March, beginning of April. I'll find the little sprouts and I'll pull them up and I'll just put them on top of my egg salad sandwich. So it's like a super low amount. So I'll still get the incredible benefits, the omega-3s, the magnesium, the selenium, um, and the other vitamins and minerals that are in garlic mustard, but a, a small amount, you know, so that I don't have to worry about. Sorry, no. Anyway, so this is black walnuts. And that's for like to say, oh, you know, what, do you, what can you collect in the end of the summer and the fall? Okay, black walnuts start falling from the trees. And there's a whole way to prepare those. So some of these plants you'll find are quick and easy to prepare. You can eat them raw. You can just throw them in a salad, whatever. But then some things take a lot to process. Black walnuts, you have to go through like a whole process of husking them, like pickling them and then husking them and everything. So that's why it's great to look these up in the book and be like, oh man, I can't believe I have to pickle these and then step, stomp on them with boots on and then, you know, get the shell out and all this stuff. You may not want to do that, right? So once you look that up, you can see what you're in for. Um, and then over here, I just, um, it's maple sugaring. So I, I like to tap trees, like I'll tap like a whole bunch of different trees. Uh, ma maples are only one kind of tree you can tap for syrup. You can do birch, um, box elder, um, linden, all kinds of trees. Uh, and then some of them you, you tap in certain months, like maple syrup. And then after that, you tap birch. And then, you know, there's also other trees you can tap after. So there's different seasons, right? So usually I'll tap, well, it depends on the season. I'll start tapping at the end of January because sometimes the maple trees will start, the sap will start at the end of January. Hasn't been in the last few years. Okay, is that good we went over those? Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to go over the ones on the, on the screen. Okay, so how do we identify, other than cheating with this app, right? How do we identify? We go through things called key identifiers, and these are super important. Because if they're not there, those key identifiers aren't there, then we don't know if we've identified the plant safely, right? So key identifiers could be things like leaf shape and leaf pattern. So here we've got wild strawberries up here. They have three leaves. I mean, so does poison ivy, right? But the three leaves here have serrated edges and poison ivy tends to have a smooth edge unless it's got like a mitten tends to have a smooth edge around the leaf. So leaf edge matters. And then we have things like leaf pattern. How does the, how does the pattern grow? So here we have plantain. And you can see that grows in a rosette. And then it's got its seed stalk here that comes up. So plantain grows in a rosette like a dandelion in a circle on the ground. So that is a key identifier growing in a rosette on the ground. Okay, and this is the plant that, like I said, the Johnson & Johnson brothers um, thought of the Band-Aid with because it helps disinfect and heal and protect cuts. They used to wrap it around their hand and um, where, where the cut was, but it also is incredible for bee stings. Absolutely incredible for like yellow jacket stings. You actually chew up the leaf and then spit it out and put it on the sting. I know that sounds gross, but it's a spit poultice and leave that on the sting and it will actually extract the venom out of your skin. And 15 to 20 minutes later, you have no sting, no redness, no swelling, nothing. Okay. Avoid poisonous lookalikes. So up here, I, I have a mushroom. I know we're not really talking about mushrooms today, but this is a chicken of the woods. It's a late horse Cincinnatus. It grows, late horse Cincinnatus grows on the ground at the foot of the oak tree in a rosette, oh, it's like in that round rosette shape. It's a polypore like this reishi here, no gills under there. 
Because so when we're going through key identifiers, it's going to say it's a polypore. That just means that it's got porous little holes underneath instead of gills. So if you thought you had a chicken in the woods and then you turned it over and had gills, you don't have a chicken in the woods. You have something else, right? All right. And uh, to avoid poisonous lookalikes, I tell people start with polypores with mushrooms if you want to be safe. If you want to avoid poisonous lookalikes, there's very few, very few um, poisonous polypores here in New England. Almost none. Did you say that growth? Right at the foot of the oak tree, instead of on the dead or dying oak tree, like um, the later porous um, sulfurous does. That's the one that's yellow underneath. It looks just like that, except it's, it's yellow underneath, and it's on the tree, like, like on the wood. And this one grows on the ground because it taps into the roots. That's what it's work, it works on, is the roots. It's called a butt rot mushroom because <laughs> it taps into the roots. So it just, it looks and tastes like a chicken mushroom, but it's, um, it's on the ground usually. Of course, I found one in a stump like two feet up to this year, but it was still tapping into the roots through the stump. Um, smell can be a key identifier. So we got different key identifiers. We talked about like leaf pattern. We talked about leaf edge and there can be, you know, where it grows, how it grows and also other types of things like smell. So um, some things have a particular smell, like for example, here's this yarrow and it looks a lot like Queen Anne's, but Queen Anne's lace is wild carrot. When you crush it, it smells like a carrot. When you crush the leaves, yarrow, when you crush the leaves, it smells like kind of like rosemary to me. It's, it's not in the parsley family like, um, like Queen Anne's lace is, and we'll get to that family in a second. So just, just ways to identify. So your book might say smells like, and that's a key identifier. So she will come out and she doesn't want you to, to be wondering. She will come out straight and say, these are the key identifiers. And then she will list them. And sometimes there's like five key identifiers. Sometimes there's 10, sometimes there's less, but they all have to be there. That's why they call them key identifiers. If you had a key and one of the little teeth in the keys, key was broken, it won't turn the lock. You have to make sure all those key identifiers are there before you eat something. Okay, yeah, that's what I just said. Okay, nothing is worth getting sick over. We don't wanna eat something unless we found all those key identifiers. So you take a plant home, that's okay. If you took the wrong plant home, that's okay. Um, a lot of people do pick shaming online. How many of you are on those Facebook groups like the foraging groups, right? You know, I mean, if you don't know what it is, you know, you're not gonna take a whole basket full of it home, right? You know where it is, you can go back. So take like one or two things home. If you're not sure what it is, take photos of it, take photos of it like where it is. Because sometimes, like I said, it's important, especially with mushrooms, um, where that is growing will give you a hint as to what it is like mushrooms associate with trees. So take a look and see what trees it's growing next to. Okay. okay. So these are leaf patterns and um, the opposite leaf pattern here, you can see these leaves growing directly opposite each other. These, this is the black walnut again, and this is a compound leaf. It just means that there's one leaf stalk Okay, so here's the elderflower. For the elderflower, we've got, believe it or not, this is all like one leaf. It's called a compound leaf. It's got one leaf stalk and many leaflets coming off of it. Just like poison ivy has three leaflets, right? I didn't bring any poison ivy here because I'm allergic to it. But this is a compound leaf. And you can see these are growing, these are growing opposite each other, but then you have a terminal leaflet that's all by itself. These things are all, all key identifiers. Alternate, this is Japanese knotweed up here. And you can see these leaves, these leaves are growing in an alternate pattern. That means the leaves are taking turns as they go down. It's like this wild grape. The leaves are taking turns on each side of this grapevine. One's on top and another one's down here. 
and then other ones on top and another ones down there. So it's an alternate leaf pattern. And then finally, we've got the, uh, the rosette we already talked about on the last slide, um, how the plantain was growing in a rosette on the ground like a dandelion. And then we have the world pattern, W-H-O-R-L-E-D. That is the least common leaf pattern out there. And that is a, um, the Indian cucumber root, which the only edible part is this little root down there and is delicious, but it's native. And so I don't like to eat these guys unless I see a whole huge field of them. And even then it's just like a trail nibble. I'll dig up like a couple just to enjoy it. Um, it's like a little trail nibble. And, um, but that you see the leaf there, it's in the world pattern. It's like a pinwheel. Mm -hmm. Oh, show the, yeah. Oh, sure. Next. <laughs> um, so I'm running a little behind. Okay, so here's something else about edibility. You know, there's like a scale of edibility where something on the 10 side would be like, this is super delicious and very easy to prepare, like, um, like a salad green, right? That would be like on a 10. Um, and then something down lower, like the one would be like pokeweed, which is poisonous unless you cook it a lot and you can only eat it as a shoot. Like right now it's really poisonous. You can't even cook out the toxins. You can only eat it as a shoot when it's like 10 inches and still the leaves are still clasping. So that edibility on the edibility scale is pretty low because you have to cook it a lot even when it's a shoot to even make it edible, okay? So some edibles can be eaten raw like your salad greens and, but a lot of edibles need to be cooked first. So I have a lot of things on the table here that you can eat raw. Um, that's the fun thing about like late spring is there's still so much things that you can eat raw. Um, but pokeweed, you cannot. Elder, okay, elderflower, the flowers here are the only things you can eat raw. So you can make cordial, you can make um, elderflower liqueur, St. Germain. Um, you can eat these little flowers, but you actually have to take them off, each one of them off the little green stems before you can eat them or make cordial or anything else like that. It's the only part you can eat raw. And then once these become berries, you have to cook the berries, like make elder, you know, elderberry syrup and elderberry pie, all those wonderful things. Okay. So again, your books will tell you if you got to, what you got to do to prepare this. And then some plants, we already talked about this, some plants can be edible at one stage of growth and then not another, like the Japanese knotweed, you can eat it as a shoot, but then you can't eat it once it gets, because it's just too, it's like bamboo at that point. You can't, your body can't um, process it. Same thing with these ostrich ferns. How many of you have seen these in the supermarket, you know, farmer's market? You can eat them when they're a fiddlehead, but then once they've unfurled, they're a fern and they're super fibrous and your body can't, um, process that. Okay, so some parts of the plant are edible while some other parts aren't, just like what I said with the elderflower here, you can eat the flowers, but then you can't eat, okay, you could totally can't eat the leaves or the bark or anything on elderberry. All you can eat is the flowers raw or dried in a tea, and then the berries when they're completely ripe. So the berries have to be completely ripe. And in this case, this is, this is um, Sabucus. Um, this is the native elderflower. And this is going to be black when it's ripe. There is red elderberry, but that's not edible. And that's ripe when it's red. So, all right, last but not least, some species of a plant family are edible and some species aren't. So, um, let's think about like um, Queen Anne's lace. Everybody knows Queen Anne's lace. That is edible because it's wild carrot. But then in that same plant family, we're going to come up in a second, there's poison hemlock, which will kill you. So some species in a plant family are edible, while some species in the plant family are not. That's why I was like, oh, you probably want to, you know, check out this book because it has the families. And you can kind of get a sense of 
what these families look like. So this parsley family is like the most dangerous plant family. It's got great things like parsnips and carrots and dill and parsley and all these wonderful things, but then it also has poison hemlock. And then it has things like giant hogweed, which has phototoxic sap. So if you pick this beautiful plant, and by the way, the flowers like this big, and it is not native here, but it's kind of making its way up here to New England. If you pick this plant and you got the sap on you, um, and then your, your skin absorbed it, even if you try to wash it off, your skin absorbed the, the phototoxins from this plant, then you try to go out in the sun and it's like you're a vampire starts to burn, your skin just starts to like burn. It's pretty horrible, right? So we want to make sure when you see things like this, especially now when they're flowering, it's really confusing because they all have these pretty white flowers, like panicles of white flowers, right? And so it's hard to tell the difference. So you have to, that's why those key identifiers are so important. So poison hemlock, for example, looks just like wild carrot looks just like Queen Anne's lace. So you have to look at things like, oh, Queen Anne has hairy legs. Look at that hairy, hairy stalk on that wild, well, you know, the Queen Anne's lace flower. Well, poison hemlock doesn't have a hairy stalk, even though the flower looks so similar. The poison hemlock stalks are smooth. They have purpley looking joints in them that, and then little purpley dots on them especially when the plant gets really mature and is flowering. So there's things to look for again, um, but this is, this is a family that I would stay out of your first year or two foraging, just don't even go there. Um, even though I like to make, um, it's really fun with edible flowers to make jellies out of them. You make a really strong tea with them and make jellies like love to make jelly from red clover, which also has awesome plant estrogens in them, which is great for hot flashes. It's great for nursing moms. It's great for um, menstrual cramps. And it also has some um, cancer fighting qualities to it. Red clover does not, not white clover. White clover, you can still make jelly from, but it doesn't fight cancer. It's actually can um, interrupt the reproductive growth hormone in some cancer cells. So it's actually really great. Um, so, so common weeds like this, you know, we all know what red clover is, but we may not know that you can eat the florets. You just pull the florets and eat them. You may not know that, and you may not know all of the medicinal qualities to them. So again, these guides will tell you that stuff, right? And if you look it up on the internet, sometimes the internet will tell you that stuff, but you're going to get piecemeal information um, on the internet. So beginners, you want, again, families with no poisonous lookalikes like the mustard family and the raspberry family and sorrels. Okay, foraging safety, how do we stay safe? Right. Again, I keep on harping on this, but look for all your key identifiers and how are you gonna know what the key identifiers are? Your books will tell you what the key identifiers are. Okay, don't eat it if you can't identify it, right? Poison ivy, poison hemlock, poison sumac. Um, you know, get to know these plants. And also, poison ivy looks very different in the spring, in the early spring. And here it's all shiny and red than it does in the summer, which looks just like any other green plant. I have seen poison ivy going up trees with hairy vines this thick. And I'll be up there like looking you know, picking something out of the tree, picking mulberries or whatever, and there'll be poison ivy like right in there, way out on the branch. So look on the look on the um, tree the tree um, trunk. Am I using words? Yes, I use words. Um, and if you see a poison ivy vine going up the tree trunk, well then be careful because I I've seen like I mean leaves this big poison ivy leaves this big, so you don't even think it's poison ivy. Um, coming down the branches. And so, you know, picking stuff out of trees. I'll walk around and poison ivy will like, yeah, on my head, I'm like, gee, thanks. And then I have to break a jewel weed, oh, which is okay. This is, you know, again, what the indigenous peoples have done for centuries. Break the jewel weed stock open. And it will have this watery sap inside. It feels like water, but it's the sap. And this neutralizes 
poison ivy, like on contact. So I will get excited about a mushroom and then I'll walk through the woods toward the mushroom and notice that I'm standing in poison ivy with like bare ankles. And I will do this because this jewelweed grows right near poison ivy. And then I'll just smear this all over my legs or I'll just put it on my head because I just walked under a poison ivy branch, you know, coming down a branch. So foraging safety, really important. Um, know how to ID these plants. Know how to, you know, so the big thing about poison ivy, I always tell people is yes, it's got the three leaves, but that one leaf in the middle has a weird long little stalk on it. So that you've got two opposite leaves. Like, let me see if I can do this with the cursor. You have these opposite leaves that are, you know, sitting there right opposite each other, but the, the one in the middle, see how that one kind of sticks out because there's a long little stalk on it. And so no matter how big this plant gets or whether it's coming down from the branches of a tree, I can see the vine, I can see the um, veins through the leaf. You can see the veins are really prominent. And I can see that one little stalk coming out. I'm like, whoa, and I just stop. And I just, you know, cause I'm so allergic. Okay. Now you can go in your guide and your guide will tell you things like, oh, lamb's quarters. It's one of the top most nutritious wild plants on the entire planet. It's loaded with the nutrients and it's, it's edible and we'll say edible in the book, but you don't know if you have a food sensitivity to it, right? People develop food sensitivities to all different, you know, all kinds of things. So it's, if it's the first time that you've ever eaten your plant here that you found and you've ID'd safely with all your key identifiers, just eat a small amount, like eat this much and wait eight hours and see how you're doing. Don't eat a whole plate full of the food if it's the first time that you've ever eaten it because you don't know if you have a, um, a sensitivity or an allergy to it. Uh, another thing that you don't want to do is forage from your neighbor's lawn who gets chem lawn and, you know, has pesticides, herbicides, all kinds of things um, on their lawn. You want to make sure that where, wherever you're foraging from is, is not, it's chemical free, right? Um, you don't want to be by a busy road. You don't want to forage anything where there's lots of car exhaust going by all the time. The plants are absorbing that. They're cleaning the air, but that they're taking in those toxins too. And then you're eating all of those toxins. So you don't want to do that either. Okay. Yep. Properly food, cook, cook the foods that need to be cooked. And if you're not sure how to cook it, you can look it up. You can Google it. You can say how to cook, you know, such and such. Um, Cause your, your guide, say if you just bought one guide, it's not going to have every single plant in the world on here. So it's not going to tell you how to prepare it. So you can look up, how do I prepare this food? Um, again, another reason why you don't want to eat things in large quantities. We'll go back to the, the lamb's quarters. I'm picking on the lamb's quarters again, <coughs> is some of these wild plants have components in them that in large quantities aren't going to be good for you. So this lamb's quarters is in the spinach family and spinach has oxalates. So um, if you have kidney stones or you're prone to kidney stones, you probably already know that you should need a lot of spinach. Well, this is in the spinach family and it has more oxalates than cultivated spinach does. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is cook this and eat it in small quantities so you can still benefit from the huge amount of nutrients like iron. It's got like a thousand times more iron than spinach does, for example. Um, so you can still eat this plant, but not in large quantities and make sure you cook it. So you can eat lamb's quarters raw if you don't have to worry about the oxalates, but um, some plants say, you do have to worry about things like oxalates and saponins and tannins and things like that. If they're in large quantities, you're gonna either need to eat a small quantity or cook it or both so that you don't get a lot of that component. Okay, and then last but not least, we got foraging ethics. So obviously you don't wanna forage in like places where you're not allowed to, like wildlife refuges. Uh, like the Oxbow Wildlife Refuge is really near here. 
um, you cannot collect any plants. They don't even want you to collect mushrooms. Same things with, with the um, Audubon Society. They don't want you to even get mushrooms, which are just like, they're like a fruit. Um, try to respect that. Um, if go to the website for some Sudbury Valley trustee lands, don't allow foraging, but then some Sudbury Valley trustee plant um, lands do allow foraging. Go to the websites where, wherever you're planning to go. Some conservation lands don't allow it. There's some conservation lands in uh, Waltham, for example. They just don't allow, it says do not disturb any plants. So that means don't forage, right? So stick to areas where you're allowed to. You don't want to give foraging a bad name. You don't want to end up like Rhode Island where they don't allow foraging in any of the um, state parks and it's a real bummer. So try to um, you know, respect that. Yep, and we're going to fo focus on mostly like invasive plants like this lady's thumb here and um, the Asiatic dayflower. Um, and plants that aren't native that have invaded our environment and want to eat as many of them as possible, as long as they're edible. Right. And renewable native edibles that are abundant, right? Then you want to worry about am I spreading seeds? So, like um, garlic mustard, for example, if you wait too long to harvest the garlic mustard, they have these seed pods. And each of these little seed pods has hundreds of tiny little black round seeds. And when you're collecting them, you could spread the seeds. So in some states, it's illegal to collect native plants that are, that are seeding out because you're gonna spread them all over the place, right? So be careful of that. When I, when I get my autumn berries, I don't spread any of the wild seeds. Like I'll, I'll take all the autumn berries and I have them in a bucket and then I will cook them. So even the ones that were rotten that I, that I picked out, I make sure that I microwave those, then I'll throw them in the compost or I'll give them to my chickens. They love them. But I make sure they're all cooked because if my chickens ate the raw seeds, then they're going to poop it out and it's like fertilizer. And then I'm going to have autoberry bushes all over my yard, which I don't want, right? Um, so leave some foraging for wildlife here. I was looking for some mushrooms in this little baby fawn was there sleeping. I know it's a terrible picture. I'm not a good wildlife photographer, um, but she, her little eye open there. Um, she's just laying there and I, I, I was mushrooming. I didn't even know she was there and she's sleeping away. I, I woke her up when I'm trying to take the stupid picture, right? So leave your, leave some for wildlife. If, if it's a native plant, um, they're going to eat it. Deer will browse the native plants and then, and then the invasive plants, they'll just leave. Like they don't like garlic mustard. So they'll eat like all around the garlic mustard and that will give more room for the garlic mustard. So we're trying to help out, you know, by taking some of these invasive plants out, leave more of the native plants for our, our native wildlife. Okay, we have a responsibility to keep that, that harvest going. So like, you know, like I said, don't take too much of the native plants, try to, try to put a good dent into the invasive plants and, and be careful spreading seeds for the invasives. Okay, any questions? You guys are a quiet group. All right, this is me. Where are you going to find me? Facebook, Instagram, Etsy, um, YouTube. Some of the stuff that's on my Etsy, there's signs about it just to tell you what there is. Okay, so my YouTube channel. Um, I have a lot of little tutorials and things on my YouTube channel. Everything's cooking with Mrs. G. And I have a card up here that, you know, will help you remember all that. But it's just cooking with Mrs. G. That's really all you have to remember. Um, yeah. So I think that's it. Yes, can leave it to questions. Any more questions from the internet? Um, I've heard that. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, I've heard that uh, when you cut down uh, Japanese knotweed, mm -hmm. it sprouts too. And yeah, I mean, I've heard that, but with Japanese knotweed, if you prevent it from leafing out at all, it can't provide itself with any nutrients. So if you're pulling up all the sprouts and eating them, it can't make leaves. Um, so one thing I tell people, just like bushwhack it, you know, before it can even make any leaves, just keep on chopping it down and you'll be like, oh, it, this isn't killing it. But like two or three years later, 
it'll have to die because it, it stores all of its nutrients and its roots and its rhizomes. Once it runs out of that, because it hasn't been able to create any leaves to make more food, it will it'll have to die. But the interesting thing about the roots is they have a medicinal value. They're incredibly, incredibly high in resveratrol, which um, is like the good stuff in red wine. And it will help people with Lyme disease symptoms, uh, tick-borne Ill illnesses. And so I make tincture from that. Um, and a lot of people have taken that and said it helps them with, with those symptoms. Any question? I have one small question about mm -hmm. the clover. Yeah. Um, how much clover do you actually need to make jelly? Oh, good question. So what I do with that to make jelly is I actually just take the flour itself because everything else is kind of bitter. And so you can keep this for tea and you have just a little pom-pom flour and I will fill up depending on how much tea I wanna make or how big of a batch I wanna make. Um, you'll fill up a measuring cup. Like say you, say you have a two cup measuring cup, you can lightly pack flowers and fill the two cup measuring cup and then you um, boil water and then two cups of boiling water. So it's like a one-to-one -one ratio. So you'll end up with a little bit more than two cups of um, tea. And then you can make jelly with a grape jelly recipe. So a grape jelly recipe will call for grape juice. So instead of grape juice, you have um, red clover tea and you make it the same way. But I, I do a lot of recipes online for red clover or other edible flowers will tell you like it's like a two to one or you know, three quarters to one, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Because if you, if you do like a more than a one-to-one -one ratio, if you put more water than, than you have flowers, you'll have a very weak tea. And then it won't be like a very strong tasting jelly. So, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, is there much difference between the, uh, the plants that are growing here and Southern Vermont. Southern Vermont will have very similar um, plants, but then you're going to see some other sort of like upland wildflowers. They're going to have some other species of things. And then some of our plants that really need a little bit more heat, you might not see that much of. So it's really interesting, like when you go, you know, to different parts of the country, because you're going to see a lot of the same plants, but then you're going to see a lot of different plants. And so that's why it's important, like this one says Northeast foraging, you wanna to wanna to have a Northeast guide, even this Peterson guide, um, it says um, Eastern North America. So when you get in your guides, make sure they're for our area because you know there's, there's just some plants that, that grow here that don't grow other places and vice versa. Yeah, good question. Um, oh yeah. I have a um, simple question. As you mentioned, uh, in New England, all the berries are mm -hmm. edible, right? Um, just the segmented berries like raspberries and blackberries. Oh, I see. Yeah, so like things like poison ivy berries, mm -hmm. we don't want to eat. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of berries that aren't pokeweed berries. Pokeweed berries, uh -huh. poisonous, right? Um, okay. Some people use them for dye like that's a nice purple dye. But yeah, the only um, rule of thumb with berries really mm -hmm. is the segmented berries like raspberries and blackberries. Um, those are safe. But then all other berries, you, you know, you should really be IDing things, keying it out anyway, like doing all the key identifiers, but um, the raspberry family is very safe and, and blackberries as well. So um, this- yeah, like loganberry, ling oh, yeah, lingonberry, um, blackberry, um, boysenberry, um, wineberry. There's anything in that family is safe. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you asked that because I don't want to be unclear. So here's another invasive flower, and it's blooming right now. Very delicious. This is my favorite edible flower. This tastes like the sweetest lettuce you've ever had. And then when you pop this off, you can suck the nectar out and it's like, it's unbelievable. So some people will make um, jelly from these flowers. And it, so this is um, a day lily, meaning it, it only blooms for a day. When it wilts, you can take the wilted flowers and rehydrate them in soups and stews. 
these little buds are like lightly oniony flavored and just like a sweet onion. They're delicious. You can put them in a stir fry. And um, I like to just cook them up with mushrooms because they have like a little bit of an oniony flavor. And then the, um, the roots, they, they're kind of like a sweet, they look like a sweet potato, but you can eat those. They're like little, little mini sweet potatoes and you can eat the, the shoots when they come up in the spring, as long as you know what flower it is, right? Okay, so this day lily has, okay, key identifiers for this, because there's other lilies like Easter lily, not edible, right? Um, tiger lilies, not edible. You want the day lily, the, the Asian day lily that has no leaves on the stalk. The stalk is just bare all the way down. Um, and then other key identifiers in here is that these are the only real petals. These, these three on the inside. These three on the outside are actually tepals. They're like a modified sepal. And they taste the same, they're just a little fleshier. So you can see like the, the real petals are like thinner and then the, the um, tepals are like a thicker and fleshier and you can eat them too. And then the, the um, inside here, the stamens and the pistils and stuff are kind of spicy. I don't really like to eat those. So I'll just kind of leave those, but um, just make sure that it's the, the common Asian daylily. It's an orange daylily and it has no flowers on its stalk. It's just bare. Um, so that I just wanted to point out because they're everywhere right now. They're blooming right now. Um, I, that's the only one I eat of day lilies. Oh. Yeah, I know there's a lot of other cultivated day um, and some people will eat the, there's like um, yellow ones. There's yellow ones that also have a bare stock. Um, but since there's so many different cultivated varieties and no one's really researched to see which ones are edible or not, I just stick to those. But they're so common, they're like everywhere now. Um, and they're kind of invasive, they are invasive. Um, they spread underground with those rhizomes. And so once you like plant one in your yard, I don't know if anybody's experienced this, but like you plant like one or two in your yard and then you've got like 50, um, they just kind of spread underground. And so if you don't like them spreading underground, then in the fall, when they die back, dig up those little rhizomes, they're like potatoes and, and eat them, you know? That way it you know, eats your invasives. Um, can you recommend any local foraging places for a beginner? Oh, to like go and forage? Yeah. Oh, okay. So again, Sudbury Valley Trustees, I'm one of their programmers. Um, some of their places will let you forage and some of them won't. So go on their website. Uh, I like Stearns Farm in Framingham. Um, they have, they're like an organic farm and some of their fields they'll lay fallow and the fallow fields will have awesome things like amaranth, wild amaranth, which is extremely nutritious and it'll have lamb's quarters and all kinds of, a, purslane, purslane is really, really good for you. Another invasive plant and it seems to take over at farms. Um, so there's a lot of, look like, um, Contact apple orchards and things, um, Stowe Farm, it, um, no, Carver Hill and Stowe. I used to forage there. Um, I know they changed hands. Um, I think it belongs to Stowe now, the, the town of Stowe, but they had tons of purslane. And so I used to go, they didn't mind if I foraged there. Um, so where, where the, the weeds have taken over, um, like the, in their edges of their fields and things like that, they actually liked us coming in and taking that because it's such an invasive plant. It was like encroaching on their fields, their raspberries and things like that. So make friends with local small farms and um, conservation lands around here. Um, there's a lot of conservation lands around here and most of them um, don't have anything on their website that says don't, don't forage. Um, DCR lands um, and things like that. I always check the websites first. And another nice thing about checking the website is it might tell you what kinds of trees or what to expect, or they'll have trail maps and you'll see where the wetlands are and you'll see if there's a pond and things like that. Like, like if you're looking for elderberry, they like ponds. So, um, you know, whatever you're looking for, if, if it needs a certain tree or it needs a certain environment, 
you can you can check that on these websites and see. But there's so many places uh, around here uh, to hike, and they and they there's nothing saying that you can't collect. You know, of course, if there's a sign, if you get there and there's a sign, it's kind of a bummer. But um, you know, I, I usually they'll post it on their website and they'll say, "Do not disturb plants," and stuff like that, if they don't allow it. Um, I do. <laughs> I lead it, but um, yeah, there's there. Up until recently, there was not a lot of people. It was just like me and Russ Cohen with um, Sardberry Valley Trustees, and Russ Cohen does lead tours. I, I don't know how to find out. He usually does it through Sardberry Valley Trustees. Um, there's, if you live up in Essex, there is um, um, one of my friends just started a foraging company up in Essex. Um, she's also with the Boston Mycological Club. So it's called Essex Forays. And then I have a friend, um, Christine up, Christine Gagnon. She's up in New Hampshire and she started Ookanook Foraging Company. She mostly does mushrooms, but she's up in, in New Hampshire. Um, but yeah, not like, I'm kind of it here. <laughs> um, but you know, more and more people are starting to lead tours. Um, but be careful because I've had some people come to my classes and and they've just gotten people like to to show them mushrooms and they're not really I guess they're just not experienced enough or something and so um, one woman had kind of gotten gotten sick from the mushrooms that like someone had showed them and and didn't really know like the real names for the mushrooms they didn't really know how to ID them be careful if someone just like walks up to a mushroom or a plant and says, this is this. And you say, well, how do you know that? And they can't list the key identifiers. Um, they just say, I know it because it looks like it. I mean, you know, um, my grandparents and relatives did that. You know, my grandmother didn't do it. My grandmother taught me. She would tell me, this is why this is this flower. And she would point out key identifiers. Um, and that's how I grew up was with my grandmother. But, you know, sometimes I'd be with like, um, you know, a neighbor or, or someone um, who knew what these things were, but couldn't tell you why. You really need to know why. Um, because you, this is, this app will do that for you now. It'll say, oh, this is this, but it won't tell you why. So you're not sure what you have. You, you have to go through those key identifiers. So you wanna make sure that the person who's leading you around is, is knowledgeable. Um, and then we had a question about foraging for mulberries. Can mm -hmm. you eat white ones? How long did they last if they refrigerated? Can you make jelly with them? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so there's different varieties of mulberries, right? Um, I grew up on Long Island and um, there were black mulberries there, like the dark ones. And there were also the white varieties. There was a white variety in my yard. And this is an example of like when I had a neighbor tell me what it was, but couldn't tell me why. So I'm like seven years old climbing this tree and the white mulberries, okay, all mulberries are kind of like greenish or white when they're not, right? But these were soft and ripe and you could smell them. It's like this sweet cloying smell and they start dropping to the ground and rotting and you could just smell them everywhere. So I'm like, I'm up in this tree and there's these nice soft berries and I'm wondering if I can eat them and my neighbor was out and I was like, I was like, can you eat these berries? And he's like, oh yeah, they're mulberries. But he didn't tell me why or how you ID them or anything. So I just started eating the berries. I was like seven years old, started eating the berries. Um, and then I went down to the park and I saw what looked like mulberries, but they were like really dark purple and they had red juice when I squished them. And I'm like, can I eat these too? But me being like seven years old, I ate them and they were delicious. And I liked them better than the white ones that were in my yard because the right ones, when they get too really ripe, they're just too sweet. You know, it's just a matter of taste. Some people like the white ones more. Some people like the, the black ones more. Um, but I like to like, I don't like to leave the little woody stem. I'll like pick everything off the berry except for the berry. And then I'll throw them in muffins and you can make jellies with them just like you would, you know, like a grape jelly. Um, or a raspberry jam, things like that. Um, and I tried drying them once, so like, so like had like a raisin. <laughs> no, so I have a dehydrator and I like to like dehydrate, but um, that was not a good raisin. 
I wouldn't recommend drying them, but yeah, like you make jellies and jams and um, my favorite thing is to just like throw them in instead of like a blueberry muffin recipe, but instead of blueberries, I just throw them in there. Really, really good. I love them. Yeah. Um, someone says, I read that golden seal berries are the only mm -hmm. toxic aggregate berry in the Northeast. Does the plant itself have thorns like with raspberries? That's really rare to find golden seal. So I don't know. It, it doesn't have thorns that I know of. So I think that was it for the online questions. Um, I'm going to wrap up the online portion. I know there are a lot of questions about just the recommendations that you had. Mm -hmm. um, but so in our recap email, I can include the books that Rachel has, has suggested, um, all of Rachel's um, social media platforms and her website. Um, I'll include uh, her friend's companies that she suggested and such. Um, so yeah, be sure to keep an email, an eye out for that email. Thank you everyone so much for joining in um, and have a good night.